So, um, well, go ahead and get started for today. Uh, the homework, go ahead and turn that in in the front, um, and then uh, there's going to be a much shorter homework assignment tonight. That was probably the longest homework assignment that you're going to have, uh, at least for a little while. Um, the for the quizzes, I'm not going to go spend the last three going over the whole quiz. Um, but one thing that I did want to mention in particular is a lot of people got mixed up in terms of units on the one question where you had to calculate sodium current, and potassium current, and um, and total current. Um, and in particular, it seemed like people that were using the scientific notation rather than the pico and milli and, and nano and micro amps and so on um, were getting more tripped up. I don't know if that's because people who were using the metric prefixes um, were just more comfortable with with um, with sort of converting these things. Um, and people who were using the scientific notation, um, the tens of the minus whatever, were, were a little bit less comfortable. Um, or if um, or if it just uh, ends up being easier uh, to do for whatever reason. Um, but I do encourage you to um, review that problem in particular, um, as well as anything else that you miss, um, and, and, uh, and make sure that you can sort of work through those calculations and keep track of the units, um, because it ends up making a difference. If you're off by a factor of 10, um, then, uh, then that will affect whether you think the total current is in or out, which is going to then uh, give you the wrong answer in terms of what's happening, whether the cell's firing that potential or not. So, um, so I definitely encourage you to look through all of that. Um, as well as, of course, any other questions that you missed part of. Uh, the key is now up on Blackboard, and so if you um, have any questions about the grade that you got or about the points that you missed on a particular question, um, please uh, send me an email and or come talk to me about it, um, and, we'll, uh, and we'll work through it with you. I'm trying to get these back to you. I, I'm getting these back to you today because um, we have an exam coming up early next week, uh, and so and this material for, that was on the quiz is going to be between 40 and 50 percent of the points on the exam, um, and something that's worth half a point on the quiz might be worth three points or four points on the exam. Um, and so, uh, so this is really a chance for you to see um, how you're doing with the material um, and, and catch things early before it costs a lot of points on the exam. Um, anyone have any general questions about the quiz? Uh, okay, so um, for today, we're going to be talking about um, about a few of the experiments that were done. Um, just to kind of remind you, the, the big question that we're asking is um, when synapses change strength, is it because we have a change in the receptors or because we have a change in the amount of signal being released, the amount of neurotransmitter being released. And, um, and this is um, uh, a question that, like I said, consumed seemingly the entire field of neuroscience for, for a decade, um, and is um, really uh, now in the process of, of answering this question. Not only did we learn the answer to this question, or at least have come to a better consensus about what's going on in this situation, but also, um, a lot of methods for understanding how synapses function in general were developed. Um, it's sort of like the Cold War, where between the US and, and Soviet Union, um, trying to constantly sort of improve their military, a lot of technologies got developed in the process. And so this, while um, this particular question is no longer sort of the burning, all-consuming question in neuroscience that it was, um, the techniques for understanding how synapses function and probing the, 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 the interactions between neurons um, that were developed continue to be used uh, in, in, um, in neuroscience today. So, um, kind of to, to, to step back a little bit, um, we have here our CA3 neuron, which is going to be our presynaptic neuron with respect to the particular connection that we're going to be looking at. It is postsynaptic for other things. It's, it's got a lot of inputs coming in from all over the brain, and so it's receiving those inputs, and so in that sense it's postsynaptic to other places. But, but um, with regards to this particular connection that we're going to be focusing on, it's the presynaptic cell. And so, um, and there are many, many 
presynaptic CA3 neurons, I'm just drawing one, um, and then many, many um, postsynaptic CA1 neurons. And so we have somewhat uh, similarly to the problem that you had uh, for homework yesterday, um, a particular CA3 cell might, might make three synaptic contacts onto a particular CA1 cell. It might make four, it might make six, it might make one. Some might not be connected at all, many are not connected at all. Um, but, uh, but this is an, a not unusual kind of arrangement to have here. Um, and so in determining the strength of the synaptic connection, you all worked out um, uh, uh, the, the strength of the synaptic connection. Um, but really, there's, there's three things that you need to know in order to figure out the average strength of the synaptic connection. Um, and that is in, which is the number of synaptic contacts between the pre and post synaptic cell. So if, if, if um, well, and then P, um, which is the probability um, of release of neurotransmitter at each contact. Um, and for this class, um, for at least today, we're going to be assuming that sort of all the, that the probability of release of contact A, contact B, and contact C is all the same. And um, another variable that we call Q, um, which is named for the quantal response. Um, and um, and that, that means um, the postsynaptic response to one vesicle being released. So if an action potential travels down this axon, um, maybe let's say probability of release at each of these points is 0.4, so P equals 0.4. That means there's a 40% chance that a, a single vesicle is going to release its contents into the synapse here. Um, by the way, the, the, this, this, the neurotransmitter stays confined with the synapse, within the synapse, doesn't spill out. Um, so, so there's a 40% chance that this one's going to release, independently a 40% chance that this one's going to release some glutamate, and independently a 40% chance that this one's going to release some glutamate. Um, and so you could have all of them release, it would be 0.4 times to the third, um, and, or you could have none of them release, which would be 0.6 to the third, um, or you could have you know, maybe this one releases and this one releases and that one doesn't, or whatever, it could be any sort of combination of those. Um, and that was part of what you worked out on the homework assignment as well. <clears throat> um, okay, and so, but if we um, want to figure out sort of our expectations, so, so imagine, um, or actually, sorry, one more thing. So probability of release, this is a presynaptic only um, factor. Um, it doesn't matter what's going on over in our receiving cell, Release or not all happens in this, inside this little synaptic terminal here. Um, sensitivity, on the other hand, Q, is all about the postsynaptic cell. Um, and in particular, which type of receptor is going to determine the amper of the NMDA receptors? Which one sort of determines how, how much response we're going to get? The amper, right? Because the NMDA are all plugged up. Unless we zap, 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 zap this thing really, really hard and unplug them. So, so this is postsynaptic, and this is going to be a function of a number of amper receptors. Okay. So if, if something, some magic event happened and came along, um, P was unchanged, Q is unchanged, but we double the number of contacts. What's that going to do to the average response that we get across a large number of trials? We have twice as many points of contact. So get, first of all, it's going to get bigger or smaller. Bigger, or would anyone want to guess about how much bigger it's going to get if we have twice as many contacts and they all have the same properties at each one? Twice, twice as much, yeah. It's kind of, kind of obvious, but um, so, um, so if we want to, to come up with 
here for this. So our mean response is going to be equal to the number of contacts times something, right? If we double the number of contacts, we're going to double our mean response. What if we double the chance that each contact releases or transmitter? Is that going to, what's that going to do? Where do you want to take a guess? It's going to go up, down, more, more, more response or less response if we have more neurotransmitter coming out. Uh, yeah, double the amount if we have twice as much neurotransmitter coming out. Gonna, probably twice. Yep, exactly. So if we so whatever our p is, multiply it by that, and that's going to give us some some function of our mean. Um, and uh, and if we have twice as many amp receptors, but leave everything else constant, then to do it, instead of instead of maybe maybe before one millivolt response of each thing, now afterwards a two millivolt response of each thing. What's that going to do to our to our response? Double it, right? So 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 our mean. Our expected mean, if we if we simulate this axon a lot of times, uh, we sort of simulate weight, stimulate weight, stimulate weight, and look at the average across all of it. Um, it's going to be equal to the number of contacts times the probability of release times the postsynaptic sensitivity. Sort of a, a relatively um, simple equation, um, and and so that's just sort of our expectation. And you probably, and probably most people um, worked out um, in sort of a much more complicated way the average response. Um, but, uh, but when we go back and, and when I post the solutions for the homework that you did last night, um, one of the things that, that, that we'll see is that the correct answer using sort of long-handed calculations, which is what I suspect most people did, um, is, is exactly going to be equal to this. Because one of the questions that you had to answer in each part of the homework was what's the mean response ex uh, expected to be. Um, and, and it turns out that if you did that right by long-handed calculations, um, then, then it exactly equals number times probability release times post-synaptic sensitivity. What questions do people have about that? Does that kind of make sense? Or the things that seem a little bit counterintuitive about that? Sure, yeah. Um, how is the number of other subjects um, supposed to affect the average? Yeah, yeah. So if we have... Um, Let's say we have one amper receptor here at first, and that one amper, whatever, we have 100 amper receptors, and those 100 amper receptors, when glutamate gets released, we have 20,000 molecules of glutamate. So there's a massive excess of glutamate. So all of our amper receptors are going to bind glutamate. And it, let's say 100 of them together add up to one millivolt. There's one millivolt worth of sodium coming into the cell if we have 100 of these channels. If we then change it, so we had at a second another two another hundred amp receptors, now there's two hundred. Then now we have twice as many holes for sodium to come in, so twice as much sodium comes in, and that causes twice as much of a depolarization to our neuron. So do you double the um, the number of response? Do you double So so yeah. So if um, so let's say we keep our mean, the mean constant at three, or sorry, n constant at three. So we have n is three, um, p is 0 0.4, and q is one millivolt. Then in that situation, our mean response is going to be uh, 1.2 times one. So our mean response is going to be 1.2 millivolts. Um, so every so um, some and sometimes we'll get um, three millivolts because all three go. Sometimes we get two millivolts because some two of them go. Sometimes we get one millivolt because only one goes, and sometimes we get zero. But if we calculate out the probabilities and average them all together, the average is going to be 1.2 millivolts. So how does this change in, like, um, twice as many? Yeah, and so then if we put in twice as many amper receptors, now Q becomes two millivolts. And so we're going to have this. And that's going to be equal to four millivolts on average. And, and, then if we, and, and now what's going to happen is um, some fraction of the time we still get nothing, some fraction of the time we get two, some fraction of the time we get four, and some fraction of the time we get six. And so collectively, again, if you average them all together and, and keep track of your probabilities correctly, then that's going to average out to 2.4 millivolts. Um, would the answers still be the same if you, if you double the um, probability? The mean, the, the effect on the mean is the same, but the distribution changes differently, which is actually one of the things that we'll hopefully have time to talk about today or definitely tomorrow. Um, so if instead we have three, and then instead we change p to 0.8, 
so you double our P, we leave this back where it was one millivolt. Now, um, sometime we'll get we'll get um, a, a lot more times than we get three millivolts, um, and a lot fewer times than we get zero or one or two. The average still will come out to 2.4, but the distribution will be very different because this is going to be made up of one of zeros, ones, twos, and threes. This is going to be made up of zeros, twos, fours, and sixes. But because of the relative proportions of them, the mean will still come out the same. And that's something um, that, that um, I won't work through because it would take about a whole hour to work through um, all of that. But, but um, I encourage you to, um, to actually try that out for yourself and figure out, um, you sort of did that already on homework, but make sure that that sort of makes sense to you, that if you change P or you change I, uh, Q, postsynaptic response, you're going to get the same proportional change in the average. The distributions will be different, but the average is still going to change proportionally. Yeah, sure. No, I just had a question more so about that. Like, if we have more amper receptors, mm -hmm. every time a neurotransmitter is released, um, are we saying that all of the amper receptors? Yeah, have so, connection? yes, because um, at a typical synapse, there's going to be um, between maybe 50 up to a couple hundred amper receptors. But in each vesicle of neurotransmitter, there's 20,000 molecules of that neurotransmitter. And so there's a huge excess of neurotransmitter. And so it, they all the receptors get bound um, to a first approximation, which is good enough for, for everything we're going to do today. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's a great question. Very important point. Yeah. Other questions about the tissue? Yeah. Um, what about um, MMDA? Yeah. So, so the NMDA receptors are going to become important when we try to change the strength of the synapse. But um, for if this cell is sitting at minus 70 millivolts and the biggest response we ever get is 6 millivolt change, then the highest it ever gets is minus 64. And in between minus 70 and minus 64, our NMDA receptors are always plugged up with magnesium. And so for this particular synapse when we're stimulating it in isolation at a low frequency so that things don't add up on top of each other, then we're never going to get to a point that we open our NMDA receptors. So we could double the NMDA receptors, we could take them all away, we could, we could cut the number in half, we could quadruple them, doesn't matter. It's not going to affect postsynaptic response to a single action potential of this. And that's sort of what we're worried about. Is, is so, so when we give one action potential here, how big, does, how big is the response in this cell? And can we change that with some sort of experience or some sort of activity? Does that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, if the yeah, so if the cell gets more depolarized, then you can't have any NMDA receptors contributing. Yeah, um, and but we're we're sort of restricting ourselves right now to saying what happens in the below spike threshold regime for this when we're, when we're under spike threshold, and we're not having any NMDA receptors. Um, and uh, and that's um, because because what 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 uh, well, what what what, what the, is observed with long-term strengthening and long, it, is that if you if you um, cause long-term potentiation of synapse, then um, then the average response to individual action potentials without any NMDA contribution going on because they're all plugged up goes up. And that's actually kind of we'll get to that in just a second. I think. Maybe it'll be Other questions people have about this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, unless we put in more amper receptors so that everyone is two. So, 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 if, so if, we, if we double our amper receptors so that now every time neurotransmitter is released, you get to two millivolt change, then you're going to get zero, two, or four. So zero, two, four, or six. Because you could have two millivolts here, two millivolts here, two millivolts here, and you could add it to six. Yeah, so in the first problem on the homework assignment, there was no chance of getting four, uh, getting four five, or six. But also for the idea, if you add any of the receptors to it, that's not going to change anything. That was sort of, yeah, there was one part of it where I said, okay, add some more in the receptors, and, and that should have, you, you should have concluded that that shouldn't change anything compared to the first part of the homework assignment. Also, um, would the answer be the same if I did really bad? Yeah, yeah, so, so you should get the same thing if you do a weighted average, yeah, yeah, I mean that's essentially what you do, yeah, it's a weighted average. 
I mean, I encourage you again to sort of try that out a few different ways to convince yourself that all of this works. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, what other questions do you have? Okay. Um, so what we're going to do experimentally is we put a little wire that's connected to some stimulation device right next to this axon here. And then we take another glass, um, kind of like very thin glass tube that's filled with some solution and to have a wire sticking out of that that we connect up to some computer that's going to that's going to measure what's going on. Um, and so what we're going to do is shock this axon to make it fire an action potential and then record what happens in this cell. And so what, what the, this looks like is our cell starts out at minus 70 millivolts and we come along and we shock the axon um, and maybe we get you know, some two millivolt change the first time. Then what we're gonna do is over here, um, we're gonna keep track of what happened. So, um, so here I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and, so, and so what I'm going to do is um, shock the axon once, I get a 2 millivolt response. So over here I put a little dot. 2 millivolt. That was 2 millivolt. Then I wait a little while for this to recover, shock the axon again, maybe this time I get nothing. So over here, I put a little dot at zero. Then give it a couple seconds, shock the axon again. Maybe this time I get a three millivolt response. So I come over here, put a little dot, three millivolts. Then I come and I shock the axon again. Maybe this time I get nothing. Um, and so I put another dot at zero. And so on. And so I'm going to do this for a long, 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 long time so that I'm getting a hundreds of times that I give individual shocks to the synapse to, to make the axon fire an action potential, and I'm going to get some distribution of all of the different responses like that. So I can, I can show you an individual response. If I have a lot of paper and you're willing to sift through a lot of paper, I can show you the entire recording of two hours. But that would be like you know from here to to um, to the University of Pittsburgh to draw that all on that uh, amount of paper. So instead, I summarize it by just making each dot represent a single time I've stimulated that. Okay. So what questions do people have about that? Does that idea? So there's sort of two ways to think of to look at the data. We can look at the the voltage response in the neuron, or we can just summarize it over here. And this is a lot of what we're going to be looking at. So it's, it's really critical that, that everyone understands the relationship between those little blips and squiggly lines and these dots on a scattered plot. Any questions about that? Yeah, sure. The size of the shock is always the same? Yes, yeah. And an action potential in general, sort of an all or nothing sort of thing, but yeah. So there's a max of the response size? Yes, yeah, I'll get some range and then there's some maximum value to it, yeah. And so I can calculate some mean, and so maybe for this, but my mean is 1.2 millivolts, so the mean of all of these scatter points, whatever the average is, up to 1.2 millivolts. Okay. Um, so you know, I'm shocking, shocking, going along, and then an hour later, or I don't know, maybe 20 minutes later, whatever, um, some some time later, I change up what I do. So I've been going along, this, this has gone on and on and on for 20 minutes, and I've been, and every, every 10 seconds I shock the axon and see what happens. Then I say, okay, now what I'm gonna do is instead of give a single shock to the axon, I'm gonna just zap the heck out of it. And so I get some crazy um, things add on top of each other, and I just keep zapping the heck out of it for like a minute. Um, and so in that time, I'm getting just like action potentials like crazy going on in this cell. I can't even, if I, if I look at this, it's just like a mess because this cell is firing so many action potentials that I can't even keep track of the individual responses. Um, and so that, so what we say before is we call this 
the baseline response before we've done anything, then I might draw a couple arrows here to indicate the many, 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 many. Two arrows here means a hundred or two hundred or a thousand times that I zap that axon. And we call that induction, where we are inducing, creating some change. Um, and so during the baseline time, our cells at minus 70 millivolts and it's just getting some little blips. So what's going on with our NMDA receptors? They're, they're plugged. Yeah, plugged with magnesium. They, they get glutamate, which it, and that opens that part, but they stay plugged. During this business, there's a lot of glutamate and the NMDA receptors are getting unplugged. So during this whole business, calcium's coming in through the NMDA receptors. So, And the reversal potential for calcium is about 100, plus 100 millivolts, and the cell never gets above plus 40 or so. So during induction is the only time calcium, calcium comes in through the NMDA receptors. And remember, these NMDA receptors are post-synaptic. Um, and I want to pause here and remind everybody that every single time I give a single action potential, I always, always get calcium coming in presynaptically. Sometimes, it's in, it, sometimes it, 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 there, there's a release of neurotransmitters, sometimes there's not. But every single individual little blip of, act, of, of, of action potential gives me calcium coming in. Even if there's no response postsynaptically, calcium came into the presynaptic cell every single time. But when I'm doing these low frequency simulations one at a time, I get no calcium coming in through the NMDA receptors. And the only time I get that is when I go blast the heck out of things. Um, yeah, sure. When we uh, do these, uh, I guess when we're, when we're thinking of the, um, the action potentials and things yeah, like that, yeah. do we always assume there's uh, it would be an excess of calcium and glutamate and sodium. And um, ye, there's so what happens? So so yeah, when, when, when there's an action potential, we're for sure kicking off the magnesium ion. If I have some other input over here that has some NMDA receptors on the um, on the postsynaptic cell, they're going to lose their magnesium ion. But there might not be any glutamate here. The glutamate's all in these three contacts here. So that NMDA receptor's not going to actually pass any current either. You need both, you need to have the presynaptic part at that particular site active at the same time that the postsynaptic cell is finding action potentials. I don't know, does that, does that kind of relate to the I mean, I'm not sure I fully understood this. Sorry, uh, I was wondering if there's all. We always assume there's always going to be a sodium or even flow through the amp channels. Oh, and, yeah, there's so much sodium floating around outside the cell. It's just like an ocean of sodium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the glutamate, is that produced in the neurons? The glutamate is it's produced in the presynaptic cell. It actually gets recycled. So after it gets released, um, it gets recycled back into the presynaptic cell and put back into new vesicles. And so the, the, the presynaptic cell is also constantly replenishing its vesicles because it has you know, a few hundred vesicles, um, and so, and so um, it needs to make new ones and refill them with glutamate. It does keep up with that. Um, okay, so, so then we've got induction. Then, then I'm sort of done with my couple minutes of induction, so I'll go back to minus 70 millivolts, and then I go and give a little blip so of input, another one, and so on. So, and so back here in our, um, in our uh, test period, all the NMDA receptors are plugged in. This is something that often leads to confusion for people. The synapse is going to be stronger here than it was back here in our baseline. But it's not because the NMDA receptors are now passing current. They did that here during this time window, but then cell goes back to minus 70, they're back to being plugged. So 
if, if during this time frame I added more NMDA receptors, that's not going to help me when I get back to just doing one blip at a time, one single cell time. Does that make sense to everybody? Do have questions about that? This is something that often leads to confusion. In, other, in another way to say that is the NMDA receptors don't stay unplugged forever. They're only unplugged during this time window when I can't even keep track of what's going on in the postsynaptic cell because um, it's just going crazy. And then as soon as we get back to some place where I can measure what's going on, the NMDA receptors are plugged up again. Does that make sense? Okay. So then back here, we're over in our test time window here. Um, and now I've got some other spread of response sizes. And what I notice is that the mean before is smaller than the mean after. So something has changed. Something's different. And the candidates for what's different are either that there's a higher probability of release, meaning that there's more um, that there's more neurotransmitter coming out on average, or that um, that there is a um, that there's more that there's more receptors. Um, so either the question is sort of is it this, where we've had more, more amper receptors, so now we get a bigger average response, or is it this? Which one of those variables, P, presynaptic probability, or Q, postsynaptic sensitivity, um, change to give us a bigger response? Yeah? Um, for the um, higher probability of release, yeah. But what would cause the, the neuron to, to, make, to make that change? Um, so what you can do is, um, one thing that you can do is put more calcium channels heat in the presynaptic terminal. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that every time there's an extra potential, you get more calcium in, which is going to have a higher chance of binding two vesicles and triggering them to release. There are a few other things you can change, um, but that's, that's one nice sort of straightforward candidate. Um, okay, and so, uh, and again, you know, so, so um, the reason we care at all about this is um, if, so if I'm, if I'm, you know, experiencing something, maybe, you know, I hear some, I hear the name Megan in some context, and then I see somebody in another context, and like I've got sort of independent things that are not connected up in any strong way, um, then maybe there's some sort of like weak connection between these uh, ideas, and then I, I meet Megan, I get introduced to her, I, I, uh, um, I learn her name, I associate that with her face. The cell for her name, the cell for the name Megan is firing at the same time as the cell that represents the face of that individual. And so those things now um, being active at the same time are going to strengthen their connection so that hopefully I can remember to associate the name and the face together. And so this is um, a, a very clear sort of plausible physical structure that can allow me to learn something new. And if I want to understand memory, understand how it works, and possibly even help to fix it, then I need to know something about what's going on when this happens. Okay, what questions do people have about any of that? All right, so, um, so now we're gonna zip into um, Actually, before we zip into talking about this a little bit more, I'm just curious, sort of like, just purely based on intuitions um, and, and just um, whatever whatever sort of guesses you might have. Um, so, uh, so everybody's trying to think about, do you think that it is um, probably a presynaptic change? Do you think that it's probably a postsynaptic change? Um, do you think that it's maybe some mix of both? Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'll ask you pre, post, and or mix for a show of hands. And anybody that doesn't raise their hand for any of them, I'm going to call on and ask why you're not sure. So, so I encourage you all to raise your hand. Um, so, okay, so go ahead and kind of think about it. So who, who thinks it's, it's um, probably mostly a presynaptic change? Yep. Okay, who thinks it's probably mostly a postsynaptic change? A couple of people. Probably mostly a mix. Everyone should be raising their hand unless they want to call. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so okay, so a lot of people think it's probably mostly mixed. Um, so we're gonna, what we're going to be doing is, is moving through some of the pieces of evidence that were brought up on, from both sides of this debate and try and think about what's happening in those first few minutes after this high frequency simulation to change the symptoms. Um, and this quote was on the syllabus and, and everything, but I just, um, the idea that, um, that one of the things that really came out of this is not only the technology that was developed in, in attempts to answer this question, and the tools and capacity for studying the brain in more, um, in more um, uh, systematic ways that were now being applied to other questions today, but also um, in challenging one another's assumptions, the two sides of this debate forced their, their sort of opponents to, um, to come up with more um, rigid, or more rigorous um, analysis that's going to allow them to, um, to uh, have a better understanding of what's going on and make sure that any sort of so, so, you know, so, so the way this debate sort of played out is one side would publish a study that says, okay, we've done this experiment, and our interpretation of this experiment is that, um, that LTP, long-term potentiation, is definitely um, postsynaptic. There's definitely more amp receptors being added. And then the other side sort of reads it and says, that can't be right, and comes up, no, 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 what you, you forgot to take into account X. You forgot to take into account the fact that um, that uh, you know, there's so much neurotransmitter that all of the receptors are going to be saturated, and all of the receptors are going to open. So your entire experiment you can't really interpret. And so, and then they say, and what we've got is we've got this better experiment that this is going to prove it for once and for all. And then the other side looks at that and says, no, 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 okay, okay, well, but you didn't take into account this. And so, in sort of challenging one another's positions, um, the two sides force each other to be much more rigorous in their science, um, and that therefore has sort of led to, um, to um, neurobiology as a field having a more, um, a more uh, um, reliable answer to, to this question that we were asking than we would have if somebody had just said something based on one study and then nobody had ever questioned whether that interpretation was fully valid or not. And so that's really the reason why um, I find this particular question particularly valuable and worth spending um, uh, a couple, a few class periods on. It's a way to explore the sort of scientific debate that goes on. Um, okay, and so the, the sort of some of the key players in this um, in this debate, um, uh, Roger Nickel and Rob Malinka, um, collectively, um, probably uh, between a third and a half of the um, people who study synapses in, um, in the entire world. Um, so uh, uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of people um, who are all now well-renowned researchers have at some point in their career worked with these two people um, or else worked with somebody who trained with these two people. Um, and, uh, and that includes some people that are here, uh, actually, um, all of the neurobiologists here at CMU have at some point trained with them directly or with somebody who trained with them. Um, and so they've, they've, uh, they've been sort of um, uh, major forces, not just in, in long-term potentiation, but in a lot of aspects of neurobiology. Um, they also both have sort of a reputation being very stubborn um, and, uh, and, very, um, and also very rigorous and exacting in the way they approach science. Um, and so one person in particular who um, began her career working with them um, is Julie Cower. Um, now Julie Cower is one of the leaders in understanding um, addiction and obsessive compulsive behavior and other aspects of, um, of, uh, um, of how uh, brains change in, uh, as you become addicted. Um, but one of the things that she began her career doing was working with, um, with Roger Nickel and Rob Malenka trying to um, sort of establish evidence that long-term potentiation really is a postsynaptic phenomenon. That is, that there's more amper receptors being added. And so um, the, the paper that we're going to study and talk about for the next 15, 20 minutes or so um, is one that's published where Julie Coward did, did the work and, and she was um, working in collaboration with Rob, uh, Robin Lincoln and Roger Nickel. Um, and, um, and as you can tell from the title, their claim is going to be that there's a postsynaptic change that's causing long-term potentiation. That's, that's what's, so when, when you simulate this axon a whole bunch of times and then go back 
a little while later to stimulating once at a time. The, the reason that it's bigger is because there's been some postsynaptic change, in particular the addition of more amplitude. And so the experiment that they did is a little bit convoluted sounding, but actually ends up being um, quite clever. Um, and so what they did in order to try and establish the idea that there's more amber receptors was to do the entire experiment with the amber receptors completely blocked with a drug which sounds really bizarre, um, but the logic of it is actually, um, uh, like I said, very clever and very, um, and, and, um, and, um, and again, one of these sort of foundations of how we now probe synapses. Um, and so, uh, if they stimulate a presynaptic cell, they actually, uh, yeah, so if they stimulate a presynaptic uh, cell um, one time in, under a normal control condition where they haven't put any drug on, then they get some excitatory postsynaptic potential. The cell is at minus 80 millivolts, that's its resting membrane potential, and the size of this response is maybe 5 millivolts. So it goes from minus 80 up to minus 75. So the, so the NMDA receptors are totally plugged up, and so this is just the AMP-mediated response. Then they put on this drug, C and QX, that blocks all of the AMP receptors, and when they do that, and they stimulate the axon, they see nothing in the postsynaptic cell, right? There's, the NMDA receptors are still working, but they're all plugged up. The amber receptors are um, now blocked by this drug. Okay, so, so before I go further on into the logic, I want to pause there and see what questions do people have about sort of this arrangement of we're still stimulating the axon, we've just put on a drug that, that makes it so that all of our amber receptors have stopped, have stopped working. And so, you know, we see nothing, right? Okay, so that sounds sort of boring. Why are you doing this? Then what they do is they depolarize the cell just enough that, some, that, they, that they unplug a fraction of the MD receptors. And now, when you depolarize the cell just enough that you unplug a fraction of the MD receptors, now you get a little 2 millivolt response. The C and QX, the drug is, is on, so they've unplugged. Some of the some of the NMDA receptors. That's what this title means. The drug, the amber receptors are still blocked by this drug. So all of this is just our um, NMDA receptor response. And so when we stimulate the axon, we get a little two millivolt NMDA response. Um, when we look at the um, average across a whole bunch of times, they, they divided everything by the mean so that it comes out to 100%. Um, but but there's sort of some spread here. Um, and, uh, and some error bars associated with it. But over this baseline 10 minute time period from, they say minus 10 minutes is where they started, zero is where they're gonna try and um, make LTP happen. Um, and so there's some you know, mean response that stays relatively constant, but that's only our NMDA receptors. So we're only activating our NMDA receptors. Okay. So what questions do you find about that? Yeah, sure. What subject are they doing this in? Uh, this is all rat hippocampus, so they've isolated say, sections of the rat hippocampus and they've got a wire next to the CA3 axons and they're recording from um, a, some, some CA1 neurons and their responses there. Yeah, and actually an individual CA3, no, an individual CA1 neuron recording their responses there. Um, one thing actually that's, that's kind of worth noting is that in a lot of these experiments, you don't know how many points of contact there are, and so it makes, if you knew how many points of contact there were, then you could sort of more explicitly solve this equation and figure out the distributions that you'd get. But since you don't know the number of points of contact, it makes it hard to do what might seem like the intuitive experiment, which is essentially what you all did on the homework. Look at um, the distribution of different responses. Plus, there's a lot of noise in the responses. Um, so there's sort of, a, yeah, it, it, gets, it gets a little bit challenging to do. Anyway, so that's, um, so that's what they've got going on, and then what they're going to do is they're going to induce LTP, that's what this pairing is, is, what is a way to make this cell go through an LTP process, the whole time keeping this amper receptor drug on blocks the amper receptors, and then they're going to ask what's going to happen after. Okay, and so um, rather than me tell you what happened, um, instead I want you all to think about 
the prediction, what, what you predict would happen. And so I have some, some handout assignments with three questions on them um, about if, if um, LTP is, is, um, is um, created by an increase in neurotransmitter, then what, then what, then what would you expect is going to happen after this? If instead LTP is an increase in the number of AMPA receptors, then what would you expect to happen after this? Um, and so, um, and so uh, there's, there's kind of three questions to work through as a group. Put your names on the top of this and you know, find a group and I'll hand out these things and you can all discuss them and work through them. So go ahead and find a group and we'll, we'll work through and discuss um, the different possible traditions that you can have. I think by now everyone's sort of settled into groups that they know, but if, you, if you're working with people you haven't worked with before, make sure to introduce yourselves. Um. <laughs> Maybe just another uh, 10, 20 seconds to finish up writing whatever you're writing. So let's finish up writing, guys. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, so, so um, I, I've written up here and sort of plotted out um, what our predictions are going to be for this. Um, and so we've already got what's going on in the baseline. So what, um, we've got some, um, so just to remind you about the experimental setup here, there's a lot of, we're swamping this chunk of brain with, we're just dumping tons and tons of the scene care drug on it. So then the whole time from here until the end of the experiment, we're going to keep that drug on. Um, so all the amber receptors that are there now are going to be blocked. If any new ones show up, they're going to be blocked too. Um, and the other thing that is, that is unique about this experiment is that the whole time we've got our cell depolarized, so the NMDA receptors are unplugged by magnesium. That's only in this experiment. Um, every other situation that we're going to talk about, um, NMDA receptors are plugged during baseline and they're plugged after an LTP in our test phase. Only during induction are they open in every other experiment. But this one, since we're doing things a little bit differently, uh, we've got our NMD receptors on plugs, so we can read, measure what's going on with them, and that's kind of going to be the test. Um, okay, so the first thing that I asked, um, the first question was, if the presynaptic theory of LTP is correct, then on average, is there going to be the um, same amount of glutamate, more or less glutamate, what's going to be going on? More, yes, exactly, more glutamate, okay. So that's our first, um, our first point. Okay, so now, still sticking with this presynaptic theory of LTP. Um, so, presynaptic theory, more glutamate, on average. Um, there, it's, at any particular time we stimulate, more of those points of contact, and there might be 10 or 12 that we're stimulating, um, are going to release neurotransmitters. So if that's the case, and this is right, and we've got more glutamate, over here we've got our time window that's induction. Now more glutamate's getting released. What's going to happen in terms of the, uh, of the response that we see, again, just through NMD receptors, because any new amber receptors that show up, they're going to get plugged up, blocked, blocked by this scene character. So what's, what's going to happen? Are we going to see on average, more of a response, less of a response, the same response, looking through our NMDA receptors. More of a response. Um, why? Why are we going to see more of a response? Because there's a higher chance of that being released, so it's a higher chance of the NMDA receptors opening up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you know, we've got 12 points of contact. Maybe beforehand, on average, four of them were active because our probability of release was 0.3 or something. And now after LTP, maybe on average, eight of them are active. Um, and eight of them are releasing glutamate. And so, and so before LTP, um, four of our points of contact on, on average, sometimes it was five, sometimes it was one, sometimes it was zero. But on average, four of the points of contact released glutamate, and we saw a response to the NMD receptors there. Now, on average, eight of those points of contact are going to release uh, glutamate. Sometimes it might be two, sometimes it might be all 12, 
Sometimes it might be 10, sometimes it might be 7, but on average it's going to be 8. And so we expect then the presynaptic theory of LTP is correct. We expect this result, where our average response during our test period is expected to be higher than our average response during the baseline period. What questions do people have about that? Okay, so now, second possibility, the last question that you had, is that instead we're going to say, okay, well, what if the postsynaptic theory is um, true? Um, so if the postsynaptic theory, we're not getting more glutamate, we've got the same amount of glutamate, but now we've got um, more amper receptors. So normally, if we put more amber receptors in, we're going to get a bigger response. That's what we need to do to get a bigger response when a cell is sitting at minus 70 millivolts. But we've got this funny situation going on where there might be more amber receptors added, but they're going to get blocked by our drug as soon as they get added. Um, so, looking at the NMDA-mediated response, what do we expect is going to happen if this is the correct? Interpretation. Yeah, it should, be should be the same as the base. Should be the same, yeah, exactly. So after this, our NMDA receptors are still seeing the same amount of glutamate. They've got some more amber receptors next to them, but those are all blocked by a drug. And so afterwards, we expect our test, our test time period to have the same response. And so those are the two predictions um, for the two different theories for this, for this model. So what questions do people have about that? Yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I forget if this is something you had mentioned yesterday, but mm -hmm. is it the case, are we assuming that the number of NMDA receptors does not change? Yeah, so for now, it's, it's possible that the number of NMDA, if, if we got a bigger response, then maybe we could say, okay, well maybe there were more NMDA receptors. But what we can say for certain is definitely if pre is right, we'll definitely get a bigger response. If post is right, it'll probably stay the same. Might, but we could imagine a scenario where it gets bigger. But, uh, and, so, and, so, and so it's sort of a, a, it's, it's a, a modus tollens sort of argument of where we've got, a, you know, if, if pre is right, then definitely this is going to happen. And so if we don't see that, then we can sort of rule out the presynaptic theory is kind of the idea. Um, uh, and, and so that's that's the interpretation of this. Um, yeah. So um, the, the, there's because because we don't really have a strong prediction about what's happening at the end of the We have a sort of guess that they're probably going to probably not change, but 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 at this point it hasn't been tested explicitly. But yeah, that's sort of a, that's that's kind of a, a more subtle point about this. Um, other questions? Can you talk about the logic here? Okay. So let's go look and see what happened then. Um, so after LTP, um, they induced LTP a few different ways, and what they got is no change in the size of the response. Um, there are two different ways that you can induce LTP, and we're not going to worry about the distinction between those. Um, with one of the ways of inducing LTP, they did get a short-term increase in the NMDA response size, but then it died back down. This is, um, and so uh, there's a short-term, th th their interpretation of this is that there's a short-term presynaptic enhancement, but that's not the long-term memory. Um, long-term memory needs to last for more than a minute for it to count as long-term memory. Um, and so, um, but this is also nice because it means that they have the capacity to detect an increase in, in, um, in glutamate release. They haven't sort of, they're not, the system's not sort of saturated to the point that they can't detect any change. So there was a certain amount of minutes because there was a presynaptic... Um, only in the first minute, but we're interested in the memory, not so much yeah. the sort of, uh, uh, yeah, the long-term memory. So yeah, so for the, for the particular question of what's long-term memory about, one minute isn't long-term. And so, yeah. But yeah, there was, there is, a, their interpretation is that with some methods of, of inducing long-term potentiation, you get a transient, temporary increase in release of glutamate that goes back there. But the, the critical insight here is that, um, is that we see the same size response, which, which, um, which would rule out the idea of more glutamate being around in the long term. 
Um, and then they went on to do one other thing, which is just put on a drug that blocks NMDA receptors. And when they block NMDA receptors, remember the AMPA receptors are still blocked. Now everything's blocked and everything goes down to zero. The point of that just being that this isn't some, you know, um, weird response through some receptor that they're not they're not properly considering or whatever. Um, uh, and so these really are, it's just sort of showing that these really are NMDA receptors. But the critical idea is, is sort of in, in these in these um, two parts here. Yeah, sure. To account for the magnesium, did they just keep the neuron? Yeah, they just kept the neuron depolarized. Other people have, have repeated the same experiment in conditions where magnesium ions are completely removed from outside the cell, and they get the same sort of result. And, um, yeah, this one's uh, sort of the first that was done, um, but there are, there are others that have yeah, been done similarly. Okay, um, so that's, um, so that's the, the pre-synapse, sorry, the, the first um, uh, sort of milestone major paper um, showing, uh, they are arguing that there's a postsynaptic change, or at least arguing that there's not a presynaptic change, and then sort of by, by process of elimination that what must be going on is, is presynaptic, is postsynaptic change, no more interceptors being added. Um, but like I said, you know, this, this one paper didn't settle this debate, um, and so uh, Soon after that paper was published, a couple years after that paper was published, um, Roberto Malino, um, who's been another major um, player in the field of memory and long-term potentiation, um, and uh, his, his um, uh, mentor, uh, Dick Chen, who's um, been uh, a leader in understanding how presynaptic calcium channels and release in general work, um, came, uh, published a different study in which they came to the conclusion that long-term potentiation is presynaptic. And so you can uh, see from the title that they argue that presynaptic enhancement is what's going on with long-term potentiation. Um, but, but there's a little bit more math that we have to do before we can get to the logic of that of that thing. Actually, I guess I just move on to my board. But um, any anyone have any other questions about the last study and the logic of that? Okay, so we're going to be doing the same sort of experiment here. Actually, I guess I'll leave my scatter plot. Uh, same kind of recording set, set up, same things going on, some number of contacts. We don't know what that is, but it's, but, um, oops, um, but it's some constant value. So in is unknown but constant. In, um, we expect it's going to take hours to grow new synaptic contacts, and so um, if we see a change in our mean response, it's not because of this. It's got to be because of either presynaptic probability release or postsynaptic sensitivity to glutamate. Um, and so, um, and so that's kind of the, the question going on here. Um, and so what um, Roberto Malano showed, um, so if I give you a bunch of numbers in the baseline period, right, so in the baseline period, I plotted these things as a function of time, and I could also list them as a sequence of numbers. It could be, you know, 2, 1, 1.3, 4, um, 3.1, uh, 0, 1.1, uh, two, zero, three, whatever. I could, I could just make a list of all of the values in the baseline. So if you have a bunch of numbers and you want to understand something about them, one of the things that you can do if I tell you the size of, of 100 different um, uh, responses is you can find the average, right? You just add them up and divide by however many they are, find the average. Um, but there are other things that you can also do if I give you a list of numbers. Um, and one other thing that you can do is find the standard deviation of that list of numbers. Um, and the standard deviation is just defined as um, the, um, I'm use capital in here because, um, so now this is not the number of contacts, this is the number of things 
the number of, um, of measurements I made. So I might have 100 times that I simulate that, so my n is 100. So I just add up, for each one of them, I add up the size of that one minus um, the mean, which I've already calculated, take that number and square it, and then divide the whole thing by the number of things. Um, actually, that's the variance, and then I take um, the square root of this. You're not going to have to calculate standard deviation by hand. Whenever I want to calculate standard deviation, I always just tell Sal to do it for me, and it does it. Um, but the point is, it's something I can measure, right? If I have measured 100 individual responses, I can, from that, I can find the mean, and I can find the standard deviation. Those are two measurable quantities. What Roberto Malino did was he showed, and we're not going to work through the derivation of this, but what he showed is that um, assuming um, that there's, uh, that, that, um, there's some, uh, that we have some number of contacts, it can be an unknown number of contacts, and each one has a probability of either yes or no going, and then each one also has a particular sensitivity to glutamate, he showed that the standard deviation, which again is a measurable quantity, is equal to, um, uh, oops, is equal to the size of the postsynaptic response times the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Um, and we're not going to work through the full derivation of this, but the idea is if one, one of the, so, so the bigger the response is, the more variance you get in it. Um, if you just scale up the size of, the of each response, then you're going to scale up the variability of that. Um, if, every, if every number doubles, then the standard deviation also is going to double. That's just sort of a simple mathematical fact, which is why the Q is here. Um, the, the, the square root of n business has to do with the fact that there's a square root in the formula for standard deviation in the first place. Um, but, um, but one of the reasons why I have this weird p times 1 minus p is if the probability of release is 100%, then every single time I stimulate, I'm going to get every synapse active and I'm going to have the same um, the same response every single time. If probability of release is zero, then every single time I simulate, I'm going to get nothing, and I'm going to have constantly zero, and all zeros, there's no variability around that. And so that's sort of why it's in there. Um, that's sort of why this p times 1 minus p is in there. Um, but the critical thing for us is, again, standard deviation is something, if you give me a list of numbers, I can plug it into Excel and tell you the standard deviation. Or if I want to calculate it by hand, I could do that. Also, if you give me a list of numbers, I can plug it into Excel or calculate it by hand and tell you the mean. So those are two things that I can measure if I've got a set of responses. So now I've got two different things that I can measure, uh, mean and standard deviation. And each of them has some relationship to these variables that I care about in P and Q. Mean is sort of nicely proportional. To, it's just the product of those three things. Standard deviation has got a more complicated formula, but it's also, um, it's also uh, you know, it has a relationship to these variables that I care about. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? So, um, what I can do then is there are other things that I can calculate. Um, uh, so there's another term in statistics called the coefficient of variation, which we're just going to call V. And the coefficient of variation is just defined as standard deviation divided by mean. So again, I can measure standard deviation if you give me a bunch of numbers. I can measure mean if you give me a bunch of numbers. I can divide them by one by the other. Get that. Um, so I could calculate this as well. Um, and <clears throat> for sort of, well, so this, and so this is going to equal Q times N times P times 1 minus P. All that, all that under square root sign. Um, 
divided by n times t. Um, which is actually really, really useful. Because if you give me a bunch of numbers, I can tell you mean, I can tell you standard deviation, I can divide standard deviation by mean, and cancel out Q. So now, this number, which I can also tell you if you give me a bunch, if you give me a list of numbers, depends on how many contacts I have, it depends on the probability of release, but it is completely independent of Q. So, if that number changes, then, um, then is it possible that n change? Would that account for a change in that number? If I, if I have some, num some n, some number of contacts before LTP, and then after LTP, my, my coefficient of variation is different, could that be because of not change in number of contacts? I mean, mathematically, yes, because it's a function of n. Um, um, realistically, we're sort of assuming it is constant. So, um, so, so then, um, and so the only thing that could sort of biologically plausibly change in 10 minutes that would account for a change in this is probability of release. Um, and that's actually going to be kind of the, the homework assignment for tonight is going to be a short homework to sort of work through some of the concepts of what's going on here with this. Um, and then one other thing that, that Roberto Malano did is he actually, for, um, so square roots are a pain in the butt, um, and so, and, and uh, you know, squaring something is mathematically trivial to do, um, and it turns out that for sort of practical reasons, it's easier to look at one over the coefficient of variation rather than the coefficient of variation itself. And so if you square it and, and uh, flip it around, then, um, then this is the expression that you get. Um, and so, in other words, so I can calculate mean, I can calculate standard deviation, I can calculate this, I can flip it and square it, um, and, then, um, and then I've got something that changes if n changes, it changes if p changes, but will remain constant if I start changing the number of amber receptors, start changing the postsynaptic sensitivity. And so that is the logic of what we're going to be talking about next time. Um, and just to sort of, as you might, so I guess, well, yeah, so let's, um, actually, first of all, there are a lot of math that you, what questions have you have about that? Yeah, sure. Doesn't the um, n of n times p be squared? Um, yeah, so, 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 what, what it actually works out to be is um, n squared p squared divided by n times p times 1 minus p squared. Um, so, n squared p squared divided by n times p times 1 minus p. And so I can cancel one of the ends. So, so. Yeah. Other questions about that? Okay, we'll return to this, and you'll do this on the homework, we'll return to this on uh, tomorrow's class. Um, but, um, but just to remind you, the title of the paper, the conclusion that they're, they're working toward is that there's a presynaptic change. Um, and, so, um, and so we expect that they're going to see a change in P from their measures, which means that, we are, that, that, we were, that, um, they're, that we're, what, what we're probably going to see is that this number here, 1 over coefficient variation squared, is going to change. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about um, tomorrow, as well as then talking about some other work um, that's uh, been done since then, and kind of um, getting us to the mid '90s and thinking about um, some of the some of the overarching theories. Here. Okay, so what last minute ish left? What last questions do people have about any of this? Okay, so um, I encourage you to sort of review the the Jim Power study that we just talked about. Um, and then also there's going to be a homework assignment to help you kind of think through some of this um, that I'll email out in, uh, in the next hour or so. Um, there was a homework due last night, please make sure you turn that in. Your group assignment that you just completed, please make sure you turn that in also. And then finally, the quizzes um, that are graded are up at the 